In this video, I'm going to discuss a more modern update to evolutionary theory. As it turns out, Darwin didn't really understand genetics or how traits were passed on to really understand what was actually changing when populations changed over generations. So sort of in more modern uh, times, we're sort of combining Darwin's understanding with an understanding of genetics to really specify what's actually changing. And so let's go back to the fish example that I covered when I was discussing uh, Darwin's basic ideas. Uh, let's pretend that maybe just one gene controls fish size, which is really oversimplifying things, but that's okay. Maybe the dominant allele creates a large size fish, and maybe the recessive allele creates a small size fish. And remember that organisms always have two copies of every gene. And so if we actually knew all of the genotypes of the organisms in this very small population, then we could actually count all of the alleles. And if you were to actually pause this video and count every single capital B, you would come up that 55% of the alleles here are dominant and 45% recessive. And maybe if we were to really zoom ahead uh, in generations like I did in my uh, original video, where maybe the fish um, are surviving much better when they're smaller in size, I hope it just kind of makes sense that you can just look at this really quickly and say, wow, yeah, a lot more of those alleles are now lowercase b's or recessive alleles. So the allele percentages up here have shifted dramatically. And I just want, as a brief aside, I just want to really emphasize that sometimes uh, if natural selection favors the recessive allele, then the recessive allele can definitely be more widespread in the population. That doesn't make it dominant. Sometimes students want to say that. Um, whether an allele is dominant or recessive is completely separate from how widespread the allele is in the population. Evolutionary forces dictate which allele is more widespread. Okay, so now we, just, uh, we have a new way to think about what evolution really is. It's still a change in a population over generations. All we're doing here in this more modern definition is we're saying it's the allele percentages within the overall population that are actually changing. And we also have a concept for what happens if no evolution is occurring. Um, if there is no evolutionary force changing the population, then the population's allele percentages will stay at wherever they are at. And so we call that genetic equilibrium. So let's go back to maybe where it was 55, 45 in the first generation. If natural selection weren't acting on that population, then maybe uh, five generations later, it would still be 55, 45. So we call, we call that kind of no change genetic equilibrium. And so just as kind of a metaphor in case this helps, uh, maybe you remember from physical science that an object or a mass won't change its motion unless a force is applied. So maybe if there is no force acting on this cart, then it won't change its motion. But if I do kind of push it a little bit, then it will um, change its motion. And so all we're saying is that evolutionary forces do the same thing. If there's no evolutionary force, then the allele frequencies or the allele percentages won't change over generations. So we call that genetic equilibrium. They're just staying the same. And if there is an evolutionary force, then the allele percentages will change over generations. Okay, so um, as it turns out, there are five different causes of evolution, not just natural selection. Now you don't necessarily need to worry about writing all these down here because another video I will really be discussing these other four evolutionary forces. I just wanna finish this particular video by going into a little bit more discussion about natural selection itself. Natural selection is still a very important evolutionary force because of these five forces, only natural selection will change a population to better help it adapt to the environment in which it's living. None of the other forces will, will make those kinds of changes. Um, sometimes natural selection is summarized as survival of the fittest, and I'm fine with that summary, but students often misunderstand the word fittest. So I also just wanna take a minute to make sure we're clear on that. Um, by evolutionary fitness, biologists just mean organisms that successfully reproduce the most offspring. 
Um, fitness in biology has nothing to do with running fast or being strong or that kind of thing. Um, there are lots of ways you can be fit as a species. Uh, maybe you do run fast and catch prey that way, but you can also be fit perhaps by camouflaging really well and hiding from predators in the first place. Um, and so any kind of trait that helps you reproduce successfully will make you fit. And so when we, when we talk about survival of the fittest organisms, we're talking about um, whichever organisms survive longer, reproduce more. Okay, so um, let's finish this by talking about different types of natural selection. So um, all this time we've just been assuming that there are um, just two uh, fish sizes. Um, in reality, most phenotypes and organisms go along a spectrum. Uh, because most traits are polygenic or controlled by multiple genes and so you can get multiple different phenotypes. And so we're going to kind of switch to that kind of understanding in our final discussion here. Maybe we can assume that for most populations there's kind of a bell curve of different organisms um, for different phenotypes. So maybe here on the x-axis we have different fish sizes. Um, on the y-axis, we have how many organisms in that population are each type. So maybe it makes sense that in many cases, uh, populations are kind of a bell curve for a certain set of phenotypes. Maybe fewer of the fish are really, really, really small or very, very large, but um, there are a lot of ways genetically that you can come out kind of in between in size. Human height works that way, for example. And so let's just talk about how um, natural selection might cause a population to shift. One type of natural selection we call directional selection because we're going to see that over generations the population shifts in one direction or the other. So if we see the entire bell curve shift in one direction, for example, in the uh, discussion we were having earlier, we noticed that the fish as a whole, uh, as a population, was becoming smaller over the generations because generally the smaller fish were reproducing more successfully. They were more fit. I will also just briefly note though that if you were shifting in the other direction that would still be called directional selection as well. So maybe um, organisms in one extreme or the other are surviving better than everybody else in directional selection. Okay, um, the second type of, na of natural selection is stabilizing selection. And it's just the idea that sometimes the intermediate organisms survive and reproduce the best. And so we see kind of a, a narrowing of the bell curve. Organisms at either extreme don't survive very well, but organisms in the middle do survive quite well. And so that's called stabilizing selection. Um, a very famous example of that is humans, um, the size of human infants at birth. Uh, so very, very, very small infants often have trouble surviving on their own soon after they're born. Uh, modern medicine has made it easier for premature babies to survive, but maybe in, in before medicine those um, organisms were strongly selected against. If you're also too large as an infant, maybe you have trouble even being born, and that threatens both the baby and mom, unfortunately. Uh, so at least before modern medicine, um, there is a very strong selective force to be kind of intermediate in size so that you could be born in the first place, but then also survive um, outside of mom um, soon after. Okay, and then finally, disruptive natural selection is kind of an interesting case where both extremes survive better and the intermediate phenotype doesn't survive very well. And so you shift in both directions at the same time. Um, so maybe in some cases like a medium-sized fish wouldn't survive very well. It's not small enough to maybe swim away from predators and it's not big enough to scare predators into taking them on in the first place. So maybe the medium-sized fish don't survive very well, but both small and large fish do, and so you shift the curve kind of in two directions. All right, so all we did in this video is we tried to um, make sure we're clear on the modern definition of evolution, um, and we tried to be a little bit more clear about how natural selection works.